But for our Christmas message this year that I want to talk to you, I just want to simply ask you a question. What do you really want for Christmas? We're going to take our text from Isaiah, the ninth chapter. We're going to read three verses. If you'd like to stand when you find that. How many is ready for Christ coming back? Amen. 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 Everybody ready? Yep. Everybody got it? Yep. All right. Here we go. Sixth verse. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Verse number seven. Of the increase of his government, notice that his government and peace go together. You, you see that? The increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from therefore even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And the eighth verse, the Lord sent a word unto Jacob and it has lighted upon Israel. This morning I want to ask you, what do you want for Christmas? No, what do you really want for Christmas? Precious Lord, you know our hearts. And Lord, you know the answer to that question for all of us. Lord, what we really want for Christmas. We pray that you'll touch our hearts, touch our pastor this morning. We ask you, God, for a mighty anointing upon him today, Lord. I pray, God, this word will come, Lord, in authority. It will touch our hearts, Lord, and cause us to reflect on what Christmas is really all about. Touch us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. We're having some small difficulty back here. Okay. Don't move. Don't move. Don't know when, don't you breathe. <laughs> it may be the light reflecting off of your head that's causing the problems. Yeah, I wanted to get Ron's ointment so I wouldn't shine so much. He needed Ron's ointment. Well, you know, that's just spray paint up there. Oh. Yeah, he sprays it with that silver spray paint, you know, make it look like he's got hair. Uh, have y'all heard the song, <clears throat> All I Want for Christmas is My Two Front Teeth? You got that one? How about the one that says, All I Want for Christmas is You? You heard that one? And if you have been inside a store in the last couple years, driven down the road, you've heard the song that says, Last year I gave you my heart. You heard that silly thing? <clears throat> this year I'm saving it for someone special. There's all kind of crazy things, but last year was a very rough year for us. Last month was, a, was, was not great. In December, two days before Christmas last year, we went to Brother James Westbury's funeral at his going home service. A few weeks before that, we had my dear friend Buddy Westbury's going home celebration. Last year, this wasn't a great, great year for celebration with all that. We do not know who is going to be with us next year for Christmas. Folks, we don't know who's going to be with us tomorrow, right? I want to caution you before you blurt out this morning, what do you really want for Christmas? You need to think through this. We live in a dark, dark world. Amen? It seems like every week, every month, every year, things get worse. It seems like the devil attacks us more. It seems like everything that is good and pure, the world is turning their back on. And the things that is evil, the things that are vulgar, it just seems to grow and multiply time and time again. Christmas lights don't necessarily help the darkness 
that's in the world, but it does cover it up for just a few moments. And I'm so glad that light prevails over darkness. Amen. This week is the anniversary of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, December the 14th, 2012. It was a tremendous tragedy at Sandy Hook. It wasn't the first school shooting. It wasn't the last. But it sprung a series of terror and tragedy into schools. Even just a few years ago, we had one here in Florida. The whole thing is an absolute senseless tragedy. It's a publicity stunt worth dying for. It seems like the whole thing is, if the news would not tell who done it, if the news would not show the pictures of who done it, if the news would not spend hours talking about this guy's psychological makeup, if they would never mention who done it, they wouldn't be as many people interested in doing it. It's simply a publicity stunt. And in fact, the devil is using video games to train and build the desires of young people to take in a game and planning it and turning it into a life-changing reality. We seem to be overshadowed by darkness in this society. We're overshadowed by the darkness of instability. Everything seems to be on a tilting edge and we can't find a stable ground to stand on. Everything that we stand for, the government is trying to take away from us. Every time we stand and raise a flag for something that's right and pure, then they call us racist. They call us things that say, you don't love us because you're saying this, this, and this. Honey, let me tell you, the Bible is going to be true. Every word in the Bible from cover to cover is the way it's going to be. It's the document of which we will be judged by and somebody needs to tell you that your life does not line up with the Bible. We're overshadowed by personal chaos as the world has begun to attack us, not only as a group, not only as Christians, but now as individuals. They're bringing lawsuits against pastors now for preaching the word of God because they say it's a hate crime. Honey, let me tell you, there's not a hate in the situation. It's a love. It's a love. And if we do not tell you what you are doing wrong, then that falls on our hands. It falls on the pastor's hands for not educating you. My job is not to babysit you, but my job is to educate you and let you know right from wrong. And I can't do that being politically correct. I'm going to stand for the word of God. And when I can no longer preach to you the word of God, I promise you I won't be your pastor any longer because I answer to him not to the government we are overshadowed by the disease and weakness darkness of death but honey let me tell you something if you are a true blue through and through child of God death is not a tragedy but death is a welcomed reward for the faithful service that you've put in to serve God here. Many times I've prayed with several people and they say, Pastor, why can't I just go on home? Why does God leave me here? Why can't I just go on home to my reward? I can't answer that question, but I will tell you until God is ready for you to come home, you will be here. And when God is ready for you to come, I'm home. There's not a doctor. There's not a medical center. There's not a team of people can't keep you here when God is ready for you to come home. I'm looking forward to the day that we can say goodbye to this world. 
because I firmly believe, and I can verify it three different places in the Bible, that when I close my eyes in death here, I'm going to open my eyes to my reward where it may be. And honey, let me tell you, I'm going to live a life here that when I open my eyes, I'm in the glory world. I'm in the kingdom of God. I can see those streets of gold. I can see those gates of pearl, the walls of jasper. I want to walk down the streets and visit with those that has gone on before me. I want to hear some of the tales the Bible says that if everything had been recorded in Christ's life that it would be volumes could not hold everything he had done. I want to know more stories of Daniel, Moses. I want to understand that. But honey, one thing that I want to do is I want to meet Jesus. I want to meet the one that gave his life for me. I want to meet the one that went to the cross and shed his blood, took 39 stripes up on his back for the healing of the nation. I want to meet him. I'm looking forward to the day that I can be there. We live in a world that's surrounded by darkness, and darkness seems to sweep across our lives with little or no warning. People said, I don't want to live in Florida because of the hurricane. So they moved to the mountains and here comes the tornadoes. Let me tell you, where you live is not the uh, is not the problem. Everywhere that you live, you are going to be faced with a tragedy of some kind. It may be a hurricane. It may be a tornado. It may be an earthquake, a tidal wave. I don't know what it's going to be, but there is no place in America that will save you from the tragedies that come to this world because God says it's going to rain on the just and the unjust. The difference is, the difference is we know in whom we trust. And we know that this darkness is only going to last for a short time. We know that sooner or later, all this is going to dissipate and we're going to open our eyes to light. These, these things that happen here brings tears to our eyes. They bring painful changes Darkness reveals the power of reality in crushed spirits. A lot of times we have to say goodbye to people when we're not ready to say goodbye to them. But we got to say this is God's plan and we're going to honor his plan. I know I've talked to many couples, my wife and I. We have talked about this, and we, we pray that God will take us together at the same time because neither one of she took she took me in when I was just a little bitty boy in, in elementary school. <laughs> she, she said she was an old woman, but she had a brand new car. And for a kid in kindergarten... A college girl with a new car. I mean, you know, what else could you ask for? (laughs) But we've talked many times that maybe God will take us together at the same time because this is all we know from kids being married at a young age. This is all we know being married to each other. And I don't think either one of us could function correctly without the other because we're a team. God joined us together to be a team. Honey, let me tell you something. As much as we pray for that, most of the time that don't happen. But I will tell you that God will be with you. God will grant you the grace. God will grant you the serenity to get through the things that you've got to be. How do you know that, Pastor? It's because the Bible says that he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And even though the hard times come, we have got something to depend on that the world don't. We can call on the name of Jesus. When evil witnesses for us from day to day, when evil comes in like a like a flood when evil comes in to rampage and tear up our life we've got something to hold on to and that's Jesus we can continue to hold on to him the devil tries to take our world everything around us through heartless people that brings heartless actions and they say heartless things to you I mean it's it's just nothing to be driving down the road and pull up to a cra- traffic light and someone's screaming out the window at you for 
either driving too slow or being in their way. You know, they, they own the road and, and hear what, how nerve of me of being in the road that they own. I, I should have thought I should have been more courteous. They think like they own the entire world and everything around it. And, yeah. and it's my fault that they're living. Yeah. Some of them I've tried to help them out with that. <laughs> <laughs> Through today's music. They call my style of music old-fashioned. But let me tell you something. When you can sit down and listen to a song without cuss words, without sexual indulations, without vulgar subjects and vulgar lines, and if you have to put that into a song, you're not real smart. I'm just going to tell you like it is. Music is supposed to be something for us to enjoy, something to lift the spirit, something that will bring us into a mode of worship. And But everything that God has created, the devil has created a counterfeit to tear it down. And let me tell you, the music world today is one of those scenes where the devil is trying to in, in penetrate you and your children and your grandchildren through music, video games, I know your children, your grandchildren are going to be asking you to buy them video games for Christmas if they haven't already. But honey, let me tell you something. You better make sure that you know what those video games is doing before you give it to them. Amen. Yep. The devil is training your children and grandchildren to worship the devil through these games and through the music Amen. that you're letting them play. I told you this story before. I was in Walmart and a lady was asking me something about this Harry Potter video thing. And I said, honey, you need to, you understand that that's witchcraft and witchcraft is of the devil and you do not need to be getting your grandchildren things that brings honor to things of the devil. She says, well, you just don't know my grandson. If he don't get one of these, he pitches a fit like you've never seen. And I said, I know a cure for that too, though. Amen. Amen. I know a cure for that too. The darkness of human depravity is a grim reminder of the dark world we live in. And let me tell you, the darkness is there to generate evil, fear, and discomfort for those that don't know where to turn to. The senseless tragedy did not take place for the first time at Sandy Hook in 2012. It's been going on for years ever since Christ's birth. And matter of fact, at Christ's birth, one of the craziest madmen of all times created a senseless tragedy because Christ had come to the world. We often overlook this aspect of the Christmas story. We keep saying that Christ came, he did come, but by him coming to the world, it created like a rock dropped into a pond. And the evil things of this world tried to suppress the goodness that happened. We often forget the story of Herod the Great. Herod the Great. I'm thinking about changing my name to Lonnie the Great. <laughs> nah, Debbie says it just don't rhyme, have a good rhyme to it. <laughs> Who would call herself Herod the Great? Herod. <laughs> His jealousy of the chance that this new baby that had been born would take him out of leadership. And because of his outrage and his madness, he declares that all children, all baby boys, two years and younger, would have to give up their life. Herod talks to this group 
of kings called the Magi. Magi is a group of royalty. In this case, it was kings. We say the three kings, but in fact, historians tell us by searching the word, there may have been as many as 12 kings that started the trip. Some of them may not have finished it, but they brought three gifts. So it works real good in a song, the three kings that brought the three gifts. But I believe there was more than that that traveled. Why did Herod want all baby boys two years and younger to be killed? Because the distance it took for them to travel, they only could travel about 10 miles a day. And if you look at the distance from where they was coming from to where the city of Bethlehem was, that means they traveled for almost two years. We can't get people to drive across the street to come to church. Amen. Why don't y'all come to church? Now? Well, it's just too far, Lord. We live down Fort Ogden. It's it's just so far. We live on the far side of our. I didn't know Arcadia is big enough to have a far side. <laughs> well, here these people obviously didn't share your thoughts about this they traveled about 10 miles a day for two years and that's the reason Herod wanted all the baby boys killed that was two years and younger honey let me tell you something the world will do anything they can to take away Jesus the world will do anything that they possibly can to destroy anything to do with Jesus. There is no number of people, no, no number of babies that was lost in Herod's rampage. We don't know how many it was. But I will assure you, it changed many, many, many lives forever senseless tragedy is a sad fact of life Amen. and i don't care how close you live to god or how far you live away these senseless tragedies are going to affect you Amen. our only hope is hold on to god how do we respond to such darkness how do we answer to people and they say why is this happening why is this going on Honey, we are called to give comfort to those that's witnessing these tragedies. We need to remind them that as difficult as this time may be, this is not the end. This is not the end. We've got something to look forward to that's brighter than this tragedy. We remind the world that the darkness is only temporary. We remind them that we follow a great light. Right. We, we remind them that Jesus came to this world to pre create a better way and that we follow a light that's more bright than anything that they've ever seen in this world. I love that old song. It says, joy comes in the morning. Darkness only lasts for a while. But let me tell you something, folks. Joy is coming in the morning for every child of God. Joy is coming for the ones that holds true. Joy is coming to the one that does the will of the Father. Joy is coming to those that stays on course and worship God. Amen. One of these days, we're going to close our eyes in death here. But we're going to open our eyes to joy and reward for faithful service. I'm looking forward to that day. I say to you this morning, hold on. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. The darkness will soon dissipate and there will be a light that we will live in forever. Matter of fact, <clears throat> excuse me. Matter of fact, the Bible says in Revelations 22, 5, God wrote it, and I'm going to quote it. It said, there will be no more night. 
There will be no more night. Why is that? Because Jesus Christ will be there and he will be the light that will be brighter than any night. It will outshine. Listen to me. We will soon be in the light forever and forever and forever. Amen. 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 We, will they have joy there? Yes, we'll have joy. We'll have unspeakable joy, never-ending joy, true joy. Honey, let me tell you something. Here we stand here today, December the 19th, 2021, and we are now closer to the coming of Christ than we have ever been throughout history. We're closer now than we was this time last year. We're closer now than we was this time last week. I encourage you this morning, hold on, hold on. We have not got much farther to go. And from the text this morning, the sixth verse, it says, For unto us a child is born, a son is given, the government shall be on. Let me tell you something. He is our light. Amen. He is our our light and light overcomes darkness eternal takes place over temporary peace always trumps chaos hope outruns despair eternal salvation better than sin life is better than death love wins over hate and righteousness always beats wickedness Amen. i heard one person tell me this week they said, Pastor, I've done read the back of the book. I know who wins. And I want you to know this morning that I'm on the winning team. Amen. I'm on that winning team. Luke 2 and 8 says that shepherds were watching their flock and the angel appeared to them at night. Jesus came in the cover of darkness. He was born at night. Okay. There it is. Political darkness was all around when the time of Jesus was born. The Roman occupation had created an environment of upheaval and fighting Everything that could go wrong seemed to be going wrong. It created strife and fractions and atmosphere of danger. So he was born in spiritual darkness as well as a physical darkness that surrounded him. When Jesus was born, there was a 400 period, 400 years called the silent period. The last miracle that had happened in Israel was Daniel in the lion's den. And then 400 years of silent, there was no major miracle that happened. So it was politically a dark place. It was spiritually a dark time. It was at night. But that's the reason they called Jesus the light. He come to end the spiritual darkness. He come to change the government. He come to change the world. But the world is still trying to change him. He is the light. He is the light. Do you understand that he is the light today? That we need to continue to trust him. Jesus brought hope to the world. Jesus brought peace to the world. Jesus brought the light to the world for all of those that accept him and it will no longer no longer be comfortable living here when we know where we want to go can I ask you this morning what do you want for Christmas oh, wait a minute what do you really really want for Christmas you want to live with your loved ones and happiness in a place where there'll be no more pain, a place where there'll be no more sorrow, in a place that we consistently and constantly praise God. Can you imagine? I did a sermon a couple years ago on things that won't be in heaven. You can't drive down the street in, in heaven and see a funeral home. 
you can't go around to the corner and find a emergency clinic, hospital. We won't need it. We're not going to be there. Can you imagine we don't need any police to govern us because there'll be no evil? Amen. No fire department. There'll be no destructions. Folks, can you just imagine what all we're looking forward to? Can you just imagine what do you really want for Christmas? John 1, 4, and 5 tells us the purpose of Jesus Christ, of him coming to the world. And I'm going to paraphrase this. <clears throat> in verse number 4, in him there was life, and the light, and the life was the light for the people. He came to earth to be the light, to shine in darkness so that we can find the true way to go. Verse number 5, it says, The light shines into the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered it. I apologize for my throat this morning. <clears throat> uh, Diane has been sick, and I hadn't been able to holler at her as much. <laughs> So I got my throat clogged up. I'll do better next week. But I want to remind you that the darkness will never overcome the light. Amen. You can take a little bitty light in the middle of a great big dark field, and that little bitty light will still shine. The darkness cannot take over the light. I want to add in to you this morning that not only it cannot, it never will, and it was, Jesus will always, always be the light. Amen. And we need to continue to serve him. Jesus describes himself as the light on several occasions. John 8 and 12, Jesus clearly states, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. You're saying, how do I find my place here? How do I know what to do? My, my Bible tells me that if we will talk to him, if we will trust him, right. if we will communicate right. with him, he'll even direct our very footstep. Amen. He will keep us in the light if we'll continue to trust him. Amen. Turn CNN off, all these crazy news channels that's trying to lead you. It makes me sick to hear some movie star trying to tell me what's wrong with the religious world and what's going on. <clears throat> How do they know? Just because you play football does not make you a mental giant. I want to know what the Word of God says. And the Word of God is going to be what we have to base every thing on, not what somebody thinks. It's to an untrained ear, ear, the word of God may be a little bit contradictory. It says that Jesus is the light. But in also a few verses down, it says the disciples were to be light. So where's the light? Well, if you take a candle and a mirror, the candle gives off the light. The mirror reflects the light. Anybody's got a car since probably 2014 or 15, Bobby could tell us. But the headlights on the car now are reflective lighting. Okay. So we have found that the reflective lighting can be as bright as the light. Honey, we are called to reflect the light of Jesus. We are supposed to let him be the source of our life and his light we need to reflect to everybody we come in contact to. John 15, 16, that's why he chose you. That's why he called you. He ordained you to spread the light, to be the good news to the community. Jesus said that the source of light is him. And we need to put our trust in him. The light has the ability to dispel the darkness. The light has the ability to develop and grow, to magnify. The light offers power of direction. Mary even got it last week. 
these plants that we usually keep it on the stage, she had to move them out because they wasn't getting enough light. Even plants are smart enough to know they need the light to live. The reality is the world needs the light now more than ever before. We mean to, to share the message of truth being the light. The Bible says that the light, a city with light, you cannot hide. It's like a city on a hill. But let me tell you, the church needs to be a light of the community that cannot be hid. The church needs to be a lighthouse where people can find the things to get in help. The church needs to be a hospital to the sin sick community. The church needs to be an anchor to hold and solidify the children of God. The world often has a spiritual darkness. The answer is not another social program. The world's not more government. The answer to this is that the church needs to be the church that it was called to be. I love that song. It says, let the church be the church. Let the people rejoice. We've settled the question. I have made my choice. How about you? Amen. Have you made your choice? Let the anthems ring out the song of victory swell. Is the church in you? Is it alive and well? If you're going to be the light, if you're supposed to be the church, how's the church in you? Jesus said, I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. There's a difference between being alive and living. Amen. And the more we know Christ, the more living that we'll do. Life is to just exist. But honey, let me tell you something. It's time that we become living. It's time that we become more alive for Christ than we ever have. Amen. It's time that we quit settling for what's left over. It's time that we quit listening to the world trying to shut us down and the things that's going on. Honey, we need to let our light shine. Can I ask you this morning, what do you want for Christmas? Do you want to be a better Christian? Do you want to be a brighter light? Do you want to win more souls for God? What do you want? for Christmas I may ask you this morning to consider very seriously this could be very easily the last Christmas we ever spend together we don't know who will be here next year but it's more likely that none of us may be here next year What do you want for Christmas? If you could ask a like King Solomon, you can ask for anything you want. What would you ask for? I'm going to ask you to search your soul this morning. Are you the light that you need to be? Are you the path that others can find Jesus through what you do? If you was arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Are you really serving God with everything that you have? We used to sing a little song back up in the hills of Tennessee. <clears throat> it said 99 and a half won't do. We can do good Mondays and Thursdays and Saturdays and half a day on Sunday. But that's not what God's asking for. God's asking for us to be servants 100% of the time, every day, every night. Through what you're doing right now, can you win souls to God? That's the will of the Father, that we spread the gospel that will make other people want what we have. 
I'm going to ask you to find you a place to pray this morning. What do you want for Christmas? Find you somewhere to pray.